All right, so we're going to start off this day's talk with subterring machines. We've got Falcon Dark Star here, so please welcome him to the tour camp stage. Well, it's good to see the stage again, and uh, of course, I'm excited these talks are being simulcast now. Hello, Lol. Um, or is that K Lol? I don't know if that's an actual call sign, but okay. Anyways, um, subterring machines, the end of unknown unknowns. Um, this is um, composed of a lot of information that uh, I've been working on for the past few years um, with much of the language theoretic security research crowd. So um, I owe many citations to, um, to Sergey Bradis, to Meredith Patterson, who got married on the stage two years ago, I think, and um, to so many others. Um, the rest of the information from this talk comes from our experience attempting to build our camp project this year, um, the, the phone switch that ended up not quite being ready, but um, we learned a heck of a lot about electronics design and the mechanisms in which we designed it um, were intended to convey a, a large amount of the sense of language theoretic security. Um, so with that, <clears throat> with that, um, I'll just quickly reintroduce myself. I'm a security consultant at Leviathan Security. I'm still working on my, my thesis at Athabasca, just trying to finish up here. Um, and I'm Shady Tell Systems Engineer. Um, I also got a paper published since the last time that I was here. Uh, it's called The Seven Turrets of Babel, A Taxonomy of LangSec Errors and How to Expunge Them. What this paper does is it taxonomizes um, the various issues that, it, that language theoretic security posits exist in programs, not as individual bugs, but rather as design patterns, because language theoretic security is a design pattern-driven methodology. Um, this paper is available freely. It was published at IEEE um, Secure Development, so it's uh, it, you don't have to go through a paywall to access it. Um, some of the content that I give is also available in that paper merely because it is necessary background. But so uh, without further ado, um, I know that every time uh, we come up and talk about LangSec, there are a lot of people in the crowd who uh, are already familiar with it, um, studied it extensively in school, I'm sure. And then there are lots of people who uh, just kind of wonder what it is and how they can make it work for them. So language theoretic security, um, as my favorite way to explain it, uh, is a lot of math. Uh, we do the following math. For example, we use this particular piece of math to describe a finite state automaton. A finite state automaton is a machine. This machine um, is composed of some elements. Um, I won't bother going through this math. This really is not necessary to understand it at all. A finite state automaton is a machine. It has a number of states. There are defined transitions to each of those states based on each input character. So it processes an input character, moves to another state. Um, and then at the end, if the state is deemed to be an accepting state, it decides that that string is real. If that state's not an accepting state, it deems that that string is not good and it rejects it. You might recognize this from the way that we typically implement regular expressions because a finite state automaton and a regular expression are precisely equivalent. And so a regex match is um, basically just the simplest kind of parser that you can get. If you define your regular expression correctly, you'll be able to parse the input and check that it's valid correctly before you even do anything else with it. The only thing that you have to know is that your non-deterministic finite automaton, that is your regular expression, all of our things have intimidating sounding names and they're not really intimidating at all, um, accepts or rejects it. <clears throat> and that gives you the power of a whole set of assumptions, right? You can now assume that because it's valid, all of your logic code can just assume that everything is in the right place, that the input itself is valid. If your specification is strong enough that that input is non-malicious and you're good to go. Um, so that was about three of our design patterns at once, by the way. Uh, but mostly it was about limiting complexity and about validating input before you parse it, which is the opposite of shotgun parsing. Um, so importantly, language theoretic security has absolutely nothing to do with the programming language in which you're writing, um, unless the programming language is really too weak to support the things you're trying to do, which is another problem entirely. It's more about how the machine that you built works, the machine that emulates your input. More narrowly, uh, a lot of it is about what class of machine it is and how well that machine is specified. Uh, so here's a machine. Um, I don't know if this is going to come up clearly. Maybe I should have blown the diagram up a little bit. Um, can anyone actually see this? OK, good. Um, so this machine is a little device. And what this device is is it's part of the phone switch that uh, we have about 85% built. And um, the purpose of this machine in general is when somebody picks up a phone or some other event happens on a phone line, it's supposed to figure out where in the switch fabric that line is supposed to be connected. Um, 
So you see, this, this circuit has a couple of things in it. It has that 157 um, multiplexer over there, four channel multiplexer, and it has a latch over there. Uh, it has five diodes, and actually I cut off the bottom because it's just LEDs. Um, that and a few passives are actually the only pieces of complexity in this machine. How many bugs do you think it has? Lots. Lots? <laughs> okay. Um, information theory tells us that there can only be so many bugs because this is this representation. My code is an encoding of the bugs that I write, and so if my code is too small, then there can't be that many. But <laughs> there's at least one. Um, <laughs> And it's not just because hardware is hard. Um, it's because state machines also tend to have emergent properties when you have a requisite amount of complexity. Um, we, we tend to arrive at functionality that we didn't expect. And that's really the essence of a bug on which we built the language theoretic security paradigm. Um, so this, is, this machine computes three functions. It has its outputs, kx1, kx2, kx3. Um, those are the state of the relays that govern where the, the input is connected switch. The, where the input is connected into the switch, sorry. Um, it, it has seven inputs. The inputs are whether there's a call somewhere in the switch for the line three times, and whether or not there is free space in the switch three times, and whether or not the phone is off the hook. So with that function, from six arguments to three outputs, or those three functions, each from, six each from seven arguments to each of one output, um, is effectively a program even though it's effectively this simple. Um, so the, the essence of the design principle that we tried to do with this was that this, this circuit is an effort to limit complexity. Instead of using a microcontroller and writing a whole bunch of if statements and then having to figure out you know, how to do the timings correctly and wait for all of the, the various lines to fall into place, we figured, well, let's just build a circuit. It's a very simple machine. We know its complexity. It's bounded. Um, just for curiosity's sake, um, with a little machine like that, you can see it has one latch, and there's really very, very, very little else about it other than that one multiplexer, which is just a function of and, um, and the diodes, which form an OR gate. How complex or what language class do you suppose that might be? Do you think that the regular expression would be enough to express this sort of computation, or is it more than that because it has state? It's good to be awake. So I, I think it's regular. Um, I think it's regular. And the reason that I think that is because it has only got four bits of state. And actually, only three of those bits are st of state are used. Um, it can't nest. It, it can't really do anything other than like its entire output set is finite. You know, It's not even technically regular. It's within regular. It's, it's a finite grammar. I could easily make a truth table for this component. Um, and when you're designing these things, that's where you want to be. But as we learned, you have to include your timings in that truth table, too, or it's incomplete and you haven't specified it fully. So more to follow on that. Um, the essence of language theoretic security is about limited complexity and deterministic behavior. So with our design here, you couldn't possibly say, um, glitch it out and reprogram it. Um, there's no serial interface by which you could send it new firmware and cause it to do weird things. Um, and, and there's certainly going to be no buffer overflows. You can only pick up the phone so many times before the phone is picked up. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's deterministic context-free or less complex. It certainly falls within that because um, the boundary that I'm drawing here is as long as you can kind of bound the amount of state that you have in, in this machine of yours, or at least you can define that if things are nested, they're only nested kind of linearly. They don't depend on things that are across the tree structure after you've parsed out your, your XML document. Uh, they don't, like, everything, every, every notion of validity, everything that matters is findable from the place where you are in that document. You don't have to go and parse the whole document and then look somewhere else and find it. Um, that's the level of complexity that we're looking for. Um, so the point of the exercise in the shady switch, once again to recapitulate, was to limit the complexity available to phone freakers. You don't expose power to attackers when you don't need to. You shouldn't make your machines any more complex than they strictly need to be. So it's not about the language that you write in. It's maybe about the language that the compiler is written for, though, um, because when you um, when, when you write a program, um, it really is a virtual machine or a compiler for your input. Um, and 
it's more, it's not about a general theory of computer network exploitation. We don't hope to solve every possible flaw ever with language theoretic security. And certainly we don't hope to um, solve flaws where you were doing something, but it wasn't necessarily the right thing to do, like build a phone switch. Um, we're not trying to solve memory safety in general with this. It solves memory safety in a few specific ways, but you might notice that it discusses memory only in abstract terms, this language theoretic methodology. It says things like, we have this much state. <clears throat> it doesn't discuss how big the buffers are be or how they're going to be allocated or what your heap allocation mechanism might be. Um, and really, above all else, um, it's not a call for programmers to be more careful. It's a call for people to use different design patterns so that they don't have to be more careful. Um, I, the security industry has for years had this thesis that if only developers would remember not to X, not to um, use unchecked stack based buffer copies, not, you know, not parse their input without deciding whether it's valid. Oh, well, I do ask them to be careful not to do that, but we ask them to be careful once, not be careful 100,000 times in their program that every little thing meets each and every one of its preconditions, because that approach has always failed. So this is really just a, a call for a new, a new methodology. Um, it's about input processing, it's about data interchange, it's about protocol specifications. So you write a program and the program kind of perforce ends up having a protocol that it ends up parsing. Even my little circuit that I showed you before has a protocol that it ends up parsing. Each of its seven input lines have a specific meaning. Um, and this, this constitutes a protocol. It's not a serialized protocol, it's a parallel protocol. Um, there are two to the seven symbols in my protocol and one element, but nonetheless, um, as soon as I laid down the design, there a protocol also sprung up. And if you're not deliberate about what that protocol is, then it tends to be a piece of emergent complexity, which is how we get bugs. Um, it's about data interchange as well, because that system has to interconnect to other systems. And if those systems do unexpected things with the pins, for example, um, what happens if I have 100 hertz AC uh, at five volts on, on the line pickup pin, because you're really just that quick on the hook switch? Um, does it still work? Well, you have to account for that. Um, and if you don't design the protocol on purpose, <coughs> as we found, um, you, you will tend to end up with emergent bugs. In this case, it expresses itself as timing issues. It usually expresses itself as things like your program putting itself into a strange, unexpected state and crashing or giving away data you didn't intend it to give out. Um, and so those two things are supported by input processing. We need to make sure that, in my case, um, the input processing handles the pins correctly and polices the timings. In, in more software-related cases, we need to make sure that it is policing that the protocol that it's getting is actually the protocol that it expects. That there's not AC on that pin is roughly the equivalent of this is actually a, a PDF document and not an executable. Um, actually, sorry, I misspoke. PDF documents are almost always executables, but they shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. So it's a software engineering methodology. That's all it is. So um, let me talk a little bit more about the background on this product, and, uh, this project, and this little circuit that I'm using as, as an example um, of how small a machine can be before it starts to have bugs if you don't follow this methodology well. Um, this project that we had to build this phone switch, essentially, um, our, our central idea our initial idea was, let's do this, but let's do it without microcontrollers. Let's do it um, like the equipment that I was talking about two years ago when I was here. Um, all of the number one and number five crossbar switches of the Bell system, which were built with relays and vacuum tubes. Entire programs. There's a device called the marker. The marker decides where everything will go, and it does this because it's a cabinet. It's a cabinet about, about that big, full of relays. Um, so we figured, why can't we just do the same thing? It'll probably be about the same number of components and about as complex, but it'll probably be a few orders of magnitude less expensive because we have transistors now, so let's do that. Um, so we decided that much like that system, um, <clears throat> there would be no microcontrollers unless they're special microcontrollers. They can't be reprogrammed, and the outputs are easily described as a function of the inputs. So that's basically a shortcut. Oh, I need an ASIC. I'd rather not fab an ASIC. Um, here's the microcontroller that exactly does this one thing. Um, and then those verified. Um, so it turns out that you can buy chips like that for many common purposes, um, and I will get into that later, because uh, it's another example. So um, the other kind of idea with this switch is that the state should fit in a reasonable regular expression. We don't want to keep track of a bazillion things, everything complex, like for example, billing is not, not in there, it's outsourced somewhere else. Um, so 
just kind of to tie that ancient background, skip 60 years and come straight to the present. Um, it turns out that just like those old systems with the relays storing all of the state, each relay governed, it, it stores a bit of state about like, is this line up, is this path in use, which thing is next in the priority chain. Um, those look a little bit like bits in RAM. And if a computer has one thing that's finite, it's bits of RAM. Um, and so it turns out that all working computing models are trivially regular, or are actually trivially finite. You can technically enumerate all inputs and outputs and all state of a computer. Uh, much like to simulate the universe, it would take you a device approximately as large as the universe or greater. Uh, this turns out not to be a very practical methodology. And so sometimes um, when, when discussing LangSec, you, you'll always get a couple of people who wonder, um, well, I mean, sure, this language appears to be an XML document, but since there's only five of them that it can be, is it really XML? Um, is it really that bad if, if I have this bad thing just limit it in some way? And the answer is probably. It depends on whether or not uh, the description that is a finite state machine or a finite language is actually a useful description of the way that the machine works. Um, if someone looks at it and they're like, oh, this is a truth table, it's, I, I know how to work with this, um, it's great. It's a specification. People can work with that. Um, if it's like, uh, here's a list of all possible configurations of bits on this hard drive, you can't reason about that. You, you technically could reason about it. A computer could reason about it in a very long time. It could, you could indeed simulate all possible states of a program and figure out whether or not any of those states represents the state of possible exploitation. And this is largely what we do with fuzzing. And fuzzing doesn't verify things, so no. The answer is just no. If you want your verification to be doable within the year uh, or the decade, you probably shouldn't rely on trivial representations of, uh, of things that do have actual complexity. Um, there's also the question of whether or not the enumeration is sound. Um, so for example, even with a circuit of this size, it was challenging for us to enumerate all of the possible states in which it might be to figure out where bugs might lie. Um, Imagine doing that for an actual program. <laughs> so what's left after you take all of the programmable interface controllers and all of the Arduinos away uh, in our design is a whole bunch of 7400 series logic. And um, one interesting thing about 7400 series logic is that working with it feels a lot like functional programming, uh, which I'll get into in just a second. No, no, not really, no, because We've just deemed every variable to be an input line. The heckle was no side effects. Um, <laughs> so there can be, but they exist at the electrical level. So for example, as I was saying, language theoretic security is not a panacea for information security in general. Um, my methodology could not find Rohammer. Uh, the shady switch could potentially have Rohammer, although everything is so coarse and practically DC that I don't know how you would. <laughs> There's actually a timing attack uh, in our current design, by the way. So, good heckle. Um, <laughs> so, all computing models that can technically be that can be implemented are technically regular because if they had infinite amounts of state, which the next one up does, it has an infinite stack. Um, you can't actually do anything with it, but. This really doesn't matter because what we want to do is we want to reduce vulnerabilities by reducing complexity. And if we build a system whose description is so complex, this is basically equivalent to building a system um, whose input grammar is so complex. <clears throat> so with that, let's consider um, some more of the fundamental things that fell out of LangSec. We figured out uh, very, very early on that the most important thing in a language that was able to um, allow software engineers to use a language theoretic security methodology is that this language has strong type systems. Um, so in other words, um, unlike JavaScript, you can't simply transduce types to other types implicitly and just hope for the best. Um, unlike Python programming a lot, you shouldn't like pickle things and then write them to a file, hope that it remains unchanged forever in stone, and then unpickle them, because we know what happens when you do that. Um, strong type systems mean that every time we take in some input and we've parsed it, it acquires a type. Um, the way that this is expressed in this programming with solder idea is that each of these pins fundamentally has a type, and I'll get into that in the next slide. But the strong type system is really the backbone of this because the strong type system allows you to make guarantees about things like, yes, this part is validated as to that. Um, it allows you to make guarantees such as 
of all of the special cases of this function, um, because our input parameter was this, it's this particular special case. And you can make your type system as granular or as coarse as you like, um, but merely using strings and integers is simply not enough. Um, the strong type system has to have sufficient complexity in and of itself to allow the compiler to verify that bugs do not exist. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, I mean that Imagine all of those scenarios where like, you have a Unicode string and then you think that it's actually the UTF-8 string is just an ASCII string, so you just process it as a byte array um, and you're good to go, right? No, no, you're not. Um, what you have to do is verify it. And so what's better than reading in the Unicode string and having a byte array and then just outputting a byte array is to have some kind of string type that guarantees to you, for example, uh, whether or not the string is actually a continuous array of bytes. And to get there, you had to parse the entire Unicode string and figure out whether or not there are any characters that are larger than eight bits in it before you can make that guarantee. That sounds like the perfect job for a constructor, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, constructors are also awesome because uh, they prevent if you parse in the constructor, you can show that you don't have the shotgun parsing anti-pattern in your program. So shotgun parsing, I alluded to earlier, it's this thing that we, uh, it's this thing that happens when you parse and then you do a little bit of logic and then you parse some more to figure out whether the rest of your input is valid and then you do a little more logic. The reason that this sucks is because at each step that you do a little more logic, your program is going into a whole bunch of states and those states potentially touch valuable data that you're trying to do. The parser is a toy. The parser can do two things. It can pass the input on or throw it in the garbage. The rest of the program is where your entire threat model lies. Unless your parser implementation is bad, and I'll get to that in a minute, but um, the, the central idea here is that if you start to parse, and then you do some logic, and then you start to parse with this shotgun parser, um, the effects of malicious input spread throughout your program state, much like uh, the pellets out of the end of a shotgun, and it's really impossible to clean up the mess afterward. Um, so we avoid that by making sure that we have strong type systems and um, hopefully, hopefully we architect them correctly. There are methodologies around that that I won't get into immediately. But um, the other way around this, and I was just talking about this in object-oriented terms, is that our, remember how I said our deterministic finite automaton is kind of like a function and how our circuit has a truth table, which is kind of a thing that functions have. Functional programming is also perfectly fine for this. Um, if you have a function that transduces from input to verified output, that is perfectly as good as an object with a constructor. The point is that you know that when you have an object of a particular type, that the things that are in that object meet the criteria for validity of the thing that that type is. Um, because the shotgun parsing anti-pattern and effects, like uh, if you remember someone's ability, for example, to completely hack uh, Stratum Zero NTP servers by simply sending them a null key and asserting that the time was 1970, um, if you don't reject this, this invalid input document with that null key before it gets to somewhere dangerous, it might actually blow up. So let's find some types. Um, I mentioned before these two components. Um, I don't like upverters symbols. I'm in the middle of getting rid of it. The component on the left is a mux. The component on the right is a, um, <clears throat> is a latch. Um, for people who haven't worked with these particular things before, because I know that this is getting to be a little bit arcane, um, a multiplexer uh, is a device. Um, it has kind of um, input it has a series of input pins, and then it has a selector for which of those sets of input pins goes to the output. So this one has two sets of input pins, A0 through 3, B0 through 3, and it has an S pin, which selects which one of those two is valid. Um, the one that is selected is the output on Y1, passed directly through, buffered. Um, so what is this component? Um, if you were to imagine what that component is in a program, is there maybe some logical structure um, that that might be? It's an if. It's just an if statement. It might also be a case statement, depending. Um, so if you wanted to try to consider, well, how complex is this program, one exercise that I found that was very interesting is um, how much of this program could just be implemented by, by non-clocked solid state logic? Um, the thing that's after it, a bunch of diodes, those form two OR gates. Um, 
The reason that this is true is fairly obvious. Uh, if any of the inputs on the left is high, the output at the end of the diodes will also be high. And then that goes into my latch. Um, so at each stage of this, I kind of have some types, don't I? So in the beginning, I have, um, I have about seven types. I don't know if that's legible. Uh, the pins are labeled I of x one through three, um, not S of P one through three and S of X. Uh, and what that means is um, I of X one through three is a line that basically is one bit. It's a one bit type. It's is there an incoming call on this line? So I could model this as a type system and I could say this input line, this bit, um, it has meaning beyond one or zero. It, it has its context, which is, um, is there an incoming call for the line that this piece of logic corresponds to on path one, two, or three? Um, so the type has a value, it's uh, one or zero, and the type is put into a particular place in our state machine, um, pin one, two, or three. So the if statement can also be described as a function, of course, because concepts. Um, and the output lines, y0 through 3, also have a type. Now, you could model this type as being the same as, well, there's an incoming call for you on this line, but that's actually not correct. Because the function, having processed it, gives it a little bit more meaning. And so remember that our, our data type is still Boolean. We're still 1 or 0. But um, the function of this multiplexer has said, if the line is down, the path that we should be connected to corresponds to the path that has an incoming call for us. If the line has been picked up and there's no incoming call yet, um, the state actually, if the line has been picked up, we'll get to the if there's an incoming call bit later, then the state should be the first free path. <clears throat> so that's what it does. If the output is um, if, if the phone receiver is down, the output is whether there's an incoming call on pins one through three in, uh, in Y one through three. And if the receiver is up, then Y one through three indicate whether or not uh, path one through three is free. So really what this is, is it's the type of should we be on this path data. <laughs> so this is um, a, a good example of how type transaction can work. Um, without actually needing to create an object for this. Um, I won't go into absolutely all of the rest of the circuit, but I will discuss the timing bug. Um, and the timing bug is merely this. So maybe a little bit more about the circuit. Um, you might notice that pin zero on that multiplexer has nothing to do with that. Uh, it's still selected on whether the line is up or down, but it's actually not having to do with inputs IX of one through three and S of P one through three. Um, what it has to do with is latch enable on the 74 HC75D latch that's right there. Um, so what latch enable does, uh, for those who have not recently used a latch, is while latch enable is high, the output of the latch is whatever the input of the latch is. While it's low, the output of the latch is whatever the output of the latch just was, ignoring the input completely. Um, and that's a latch. It stores state. This latch stores four bits of state. Um, and whether or not the latch is transparent, um, meaning whether or not the latch enable pins are high, depends also on if or if not the receiver is picked up. Where's the timing bug? Does anyone see the timing bug already in this? OK. So <clears throat> there's two components here that are used for timing. Um, R30 and C30, resistor and capacitor. The resistor is simply a 2 kilo ohm resistor, and the capacitor is a 10 nanofarad capacitor, which means that to charge up to the gate potential of the latch enable, it takes the capacitor about maybe seven, sorry, yeah, about, I think I'm going to say seven nanoseconds to charge up. Um, <coughs> now, it turns out that this is actually the wrong thing to do. Um, the reason that we need to have timing control here is because we can't simultaneously have parallel processing goes on that says, um, change all of this state and also immediately latch it in at exactly the same time. That simply doesn't work. <laughs> We found in an earlier iteration of this chip that actually we ended up exposing, of this design, that we ended up exposing the internal timing rules of this, this latch. Um, and paths one and two did the correct thing, but path three did not do the correct thing. And when we put the timing capacitor in, it exacerbated it. Why? Well, here's that emergent functionality. We didn't know that our implementation was faithful. So what happened is um, we had these pins. Um, 
i x of one and s of p one, and the same thing that switches which one of those is on the output and goes into the latch, it happens is the pin um, that is deciding whether or not that will switch over to being path occupancy. And so what happened is specifically for path three, when you picked it up, it would shunt you over to the first available path instead of actually picking up the call. Um, because it had already switched over to, oh, you want to pick up the phone. The state's not latched in yet. So that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> This is why it's really critical um, that when, when we build programs in general, um, we have a very good idea that the framework which we're using is correct. Because for all of the truth tables that I can draw and for all of the validities, you know, I can put a uh, state of outputs k of x1 through 3 at t minus 1 into my truth table. But if my circuit is wrong and the timings are backwards, that delay capacitor should actually be on the other three lines that are switched, or it could simply be on the S lead into that multiplexer to delay the state switch, and then I need another multiplexer to do the state switch before. Either of those designs would work perfectly well and do the timings correctly, and then the platform would be right, and then all of my verification would be working. Um, this is the same if you happen to be using a library um, to parse XML, like for example, SAX. Um, if you don't configure that platform correctly and you're using an old buggy version of it, um, no matter what you do in terms of writing very good XSD documents that constrain XML into uh, a context-free system and make sure that every tag that's in there is one that you know how to parse, for all that, you're probably still going to be vulnerable because your parser is vulnerable. And so this, this notion of the platform um, becomes very critical if you don't have any reason to believe that the platform is good. So I don't do this very often um, because I find that it, it often only succeeds in intimidating people, but I'm going to talk about parser combinators. Okay. A parser combinator is not a word that I like to use because really a parser combinator is just a parser generator library. Does that sound a little less intimidating maybe? No? no? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, what it does is it allows you to take a specification document um, like a BNF copied out of an RFC was the dream, um, and just generate a piece of code that parses it correctly so that you don't have to worry about whether or not you're, you're writing a correct parser library when you program. Um, this has become a little bit of a mantra. It, much like generate your passwords, generate your parsers. Um, I kind of built my own parser sort of here for, for the constructor, if you will, of uh, k of x3, and it turned out to be wrong. Um, based on things that we didn't even anticipate or consider while we were building this design. Um, I won't recommend any specific library to do this because, um, I mean, a lot of them are still very academic in purpose, but working implementations have been built, and these are not new concepts. Um, Yak will do this. We've been using them for a while to, pros uh, to parse and process the more complex input formats that we have, and most importantly, take the specification that we have and generate um, into any old language that we intended to program in um, a working implementation of that parser that is exactly equivalent to its implementation in all other languages. Um, so, okay, I already went over this. Um, we found types from our circuit. We found that there were Boolean types and there were floating point types. The floating point type is the potential um, on this line here, um, line LE1, which goes into the latch enable pin. Um, and this kind of, uh, it gives us two emergent models of how the circuit works. Um, so are the types just Booleans? Well, I wish. The types are analog signals. And so our program in those analog signals has to be correct. And the easiest, best way to do this is to crowbar it such that um, every time you, you have uh, a Boolean signal, you know that the, the corresponding analog signal that's supposed to do it is correct because you arranged your timing capacitors correctly. That constitutes the platform. And when we do this, we can abstract away this notion of, well, what is the gate potential? Um, and is there a difference between like each of these various lines um, in how soon the gate potential for the latch enable rises or falls to the level that it should be to be the appropriate state? Um, Yeah, I already went over all of the rest of the things that I was going to discuss on this slide, but... Um, so what happens as well, is it's an interesting thing to think about, 
if you confuse i of x1 for not s of p1, for example, uh, we had a solder bridge or we didn't lay out the board correctly and those two lines are bridged or those two lines are swapped. Um, well, given the framework that I just described, effectively what we did is we violated the type system. These two things are basically exactly the same. When you cast unsafely, the thing that you are doing is, is swapping leads to places where they don't go and the thing where the input went doesn't really know what to do with it because it doesn't mean what the sender thinks it means. Um, and so this is another example of how you can see in, in the hierarchy of language theoretic security issues, they really do kind of blend together. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that. I've stolen a slide from when I gave the paper for later and um, I'll discuss which of those ones blend together. But when you apply this methodology, it's important to consider um, that the, the design flaw is a design flaw. It's not one individual bug that you can just go and fix. Uh, and in fact, when we tried to do that by putting that capacitor there, we noticed that uh, it actually did the opposite of what we wanted and made the circuit more unreliable because it let the state settle more um, in advance of when it was supposed to flip over. So, um, this is basically like an unchecked cast. Um, this is basically like my platform sabotaging me. And when this sort of thing happens, it's really not the machine that I built anymore. Um, it, it's got some kind of electrical flaw or the type system is broken. Is basically the same concept as the point that I was trying to make with that whole diagram. Um, and so now I'm going to spend a little bit of time further breaking down the distinction between CPUs and programs. Um, there's really no distinction at all. There's no distinction at all in practice. And in fact, one thing that we found um, is that uh, with, with most modern processors, you have a whole heck of a lot of microcode, and the microcode can occasionally have bugs in it. Um, well, is the CPU executing your program? Is it executing x86, or is it executing the microcode on x86 as input? You know, the program has to be understood at each of these levels, and so really, the CPU is just a platform for implementing the CPU. Um, Hardware acceleration basically works in the opposite direction. I take a thing and I make a little circuit like this, which without any iterative computation, um, processes a complex function. Um, <clears throat> well now, the program is in solder, so the opposite of microcode, we've, we've moved the other way. Um, and it turns out that because these two transitions could be made ad infinitum if you had enough patience to lay out those boards, um, it turns out that there's no real distinction at all. Um, so this is one of those microcontrollers that I talked about earlier. Uh, this is a chip that decodes DTMF. Um, you'll notice that even though it's a chip, it comes in, in a package, it's a SOIC, uh, it's fairly large. Uh, it has a whole bunch of algorithms in it. It has the digital detection algorithm. Um, it has the steering logic. Um, these sorts of things. Um, mean that what this chip is, is it's actually a microcontroller, and yet it was engineered such that you can have a data sheet that has a truth table for it. And so this is a perfect example of a microcontroller that we would accept into this design that's supposed to be built using language theoretic security principles and as simple as humanly possible. Um, that complexity can be abstracted away if you verified it and ensured um, that in fact um, for example, these outputs, Q1 through 4, is actually a BCD representation of the input, and it's not possible for me to say strobe Q1 and program the chip. Um, we would be comfortable with that because it doesn't expose the internal complexity of that microcontroller existing, and the design is small enough that it's actually possible to verify that it's correct. And now suddenly we can use it as a building block. I'll get into the danger of using building blocks in a little bit too. Um, <clears throat> But so one, one wonders as well, um, from the previous slide, is this chip a chip? Is this chip a program? Um, what is its complexity class? Is it a finite state automaton? Yes, um, it's, it's finite. Perfect. Even though the computational model in it is a microcontroller, we threw all of that complexity away by having a very strong type system and control flow diagram and a protocol for it. Um, and now it doesn't have Turing complete computation within bounds anymore. It's just a transducer from input signals in analog types to output signals in digital types. Easy. Um, you can tell that it's regular because it acts like a chip and it has a truth table. Anyway, um, so let's talk a little bit more about emergent complexity. That MT8870 is vastly more complex than my thing, so I mean, maybe it is good to have some concerns about it, but um, this circuit is small enough uh, is large enough, sorry, to have some emergent complexity. 
um, even though it has only seven real components and five of those components could easily be condensed into two if I were willing to buy a couple more OR gates. Um, so what complexity class is my buggy implementation, one wonders? Uh, the implementation with this capacitor C30 in there delaying the line that should actually be happening in advance of everything else. It's really hard to say, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's difficult to imagine how you might make a regular expression that parses, for example, um, the, the problem with this circuit is that the effects of that capacitor don't mean that the functionality is deterministically going to make sure um, that, that when you pick up the call on path three, it doesn't instead dump you right onto path one. Um, what happens instead is it depends on like how charged up C30 is, whether it does that, picks up the call, picks up some other call, um, whether the latch um, has, has time to settle in all three states or only just a couple of the states or only just one of the states, depends very much on what just happened to the latch, the voltages input to the circuit, several other factors. Um, it reminds me as well of another uh, issue that we created earlier in the design. Um, we intended to sense whether or not a line was up by using an extremely small amount of current so that we wouldn't disturb anything else on the line. And so what did we use? But we fed the line into this loop detector using a 22, um, mega, uh, 22 mega ohm capacitor. And then we crowbarred the 48 volts down to five with the Zener diode and then um, inverted it with a 12 volt op amp. And this was how we figured out whether there was lines is whether there was a return voltage on the tip of the line that we'd previously sent out on the ring. Well, that 22 um, mega ohm capacitor was just a little bit too large. And unfortunately, um, what we made for this, because the current was so small, was actually a primitive capacitive touch sensor. If you waved your finger close enough to it, it would think that the line was up. <laughs> What's the complexity class of that machine? We don't even know what its inputs are. We thought it was the pins. <laughs> So it turns out that this isn't just something that happens to people who try to be electrical engineers but don't actually know what they're doing. Um, there is a model for an x86 processor. I don't remember what it's called, but it's an open source model and academics love to use it. Um, and you can kind of just like take this model and compile it, it's VHDL, and you get a working processor at the end and you can change it up. Um, or you can do what these folks did. Uh, this was a paper presented at IEEE Oakland uh, in 2016, and it's a paper that I dearly love. And once I describe the exploit, you will probably love it too. Um, the paper is called A2 Analog Malicious Hardware, in case my text is too small and the TV is too reflective. Um, and what this paper is about is they took that x86 model, uh, that giant complexity machine, and um, they compiled it into VHDL, sure. But to simulate an untrusted fab, they drew some extra traces on the plates before they got laid down into silicon. They drew two things. They drew a resistor, and they drew a capacitor. And then they drew a few traces to connect them all up. So um, I'll briefly sidetrack here and explain the privilege model in x86. There are effectively two privilege modes. Um, there is privilege mode user, or ring three, and there's privilege mode kernel, which is ring zero. Um, if you want to do certain instructions, like change the memory model, or like output directly to a hardware device, or um, access kernel memory without worrying about the page table, um, you need to be in ring zero to do this. So if you are trying to exploit the kernel, or if you want persistence on the machine, or if you want to update the BIOS, it's really, really, really handy for you to be running in ring zero. Um, this is a two-bit um, component of, of the, not the flags register, but a related register that it's the segment register in x86. Specifically, those two bits of the segment register um, for the code segment in x86, even in 64-bit mode, dictate whether or not you're the kernel or, or you're the user. The bits must be exactly equivalent. Um, basically, nobody used the, the other two in between uh, zero and three, so they're basically gone and not usable. Um, but, so what components would I draw on something if I wanted to, on command, be able to get down into kernel mode? Well, I can draw on the chip. Of course, this is accessible to me. What the researchers did is they took the divide by zero line out of the, um, out of the exception part of the chip. And this is just a line. There's a pin on the outside of the chip for it. And so they put a resistor from, that, um, from the capacitor to ground. 
and then um, they basically just arranged it so that the divide by zero line was connected to this capacitor, which was connected into um, a, a not gate that was somewhere, so sorry, they didn't draw just two, um, which was then connect, or sorry, an XOR gate, which was then connected to um, those two lines. So this is fun. Now if I divide by zero enough hundred thousand times, I'm in kernel mode for a while until the capacitor discharges, and then, <laughs> how do you find this? You don't even know what your inputs are. It turns out that divide by zero is now something that's a function um, input to what the current privilege state is, but only if you do it a few hundred thousand times. So this exploit is an analog malicious hardware trojan because it doesn't fit into the digital computation model. Much like our problem with you picking up the phone and then accidentally, if you do the right thing with the hook switch, getting shunted to a different path, um, and listening in on someone else's call, this was an issue whereby the emergent functionality introduced new inputs of completely different types to our program that the attacker understands but we didn't anticipate existed and so aren't part of our security or verification model. Um, the reason that I love this paper is that any method that you would use to verify whether the x86 processor is correct would pass in the presence of this thing. Um, nobody is going to say, well, what happens if I strobe every single line on this chip a few million times? You'd never finish testing. This is one of those scenarios where we're trying to enumerate every possible state of the machine. Um, the other reason that I like it is because if you've ever had the opportunity to compile something uh, from VHDL into something that a fab can create, um, you might find very quickly that the thing that comes out of the compiler is not really amenable to, uh, it's more of the class of let's enumerate every bit on this hard drive and draw a truth table, um, trying to figure out backwards <laughs> than, uh, than it is like trying to figure out what a, a small circuit does. Um, so yes, writing specifications is not that hard. Um, just write a compiler for them. Just make some machines. Just um, you know, write a compiler from the implemented program back into its logic and verify it. That can't possibly be that hard, right? No. So this is why I, I spent a little bit of time talking about parser combinators earlier. Life is so much easier when you can work with the protocol specification, which is a high-level logical entity that you intended to have, than when you have to figure out from the program, or God forbid, from the compiled program, um, what its input language is and what all the things are that it will accept and which states that will put the program into and whether or not there's discrete parsing and unparsing stages. Um, it's way better to do this stuff in advance, and that's what language theoretic security spends so much time advocating for. Because every time you write a program, you have an implicit input specification. Every time you lay down some circuits, you have an implicit truth table. Um, and you really want to avoid this danger where much like this oddball processor that has the divide by zero thrashing lead to kernel mode, your design happens to be one of those unique few that has the bug. Um, so can't you just determine whether the dies in the VHDL match to figure out whether or not the analog malicious hardware trojan is present? The answer is no. Um, if you've ever compiled a program, or you, you don't even have to have used VHDL to do this, if you've ever compiled a program, you might notice that each time you compile it, it has a proclivity to be slightly different. Uh, there's a lot of non-determinism. Minor changes in your code can create major changes in the output. Um, so no, um, you can't simply take your, your code, and, unless it's .NET, and even then run it through a decompiler and get exactly what you had in the beginning and verify it. Um, this isn't really a viable mechanism of checking compilers. You have to go through all of the, the things that the decompiler gets and figure out whether they actually match. Or you would have to take the net list that you find from looking at what's on the die and then figure out if that net list has a material deviation, because it will have many deviations, but whether it has a material deviation from the program. Um, it's way better to verify the compiler once, preferably if somebody else verifies the compiler, and then use that one. And that is the essence of why generated parsers are better. We can verify that the generator is correct once, and then we know that every time it outputs something, it outputs things that match the specification. So it, it could be as easy as just figuring out whether or not our compiler worked by working backwards, but it turns out that this is actually at least as hard and possibly quite a lot harder than implementing the compiler yourself to begin with. Um, it's better if we write proofs. <laughs> and let someone else write those proofs. And so the reason that the parser combinators thing, I, I've 
want to try to make less intimidating is because it really is less intimidating. I mean, what's more intimidating? Write a specification for your protocol or um, write a, a verified program that you can show is correct uh, that transduces from one to the other. Really. <laughs> um, I'll just skip that slide since I think I'm running a little bit low on time. Um, so here again are the basic tenets of language theoretic security uh, from the paper that I mentioned, um, the, the seven turrets of Babel. Um, the first one we discussed is shotgun parsing, where continually um, you have this issue whereby um, you, your, your state that is input is processed a little bit, modifies your program state, and influences the things that are in the threat model, and then we continue later to decide whether or not the input is malicious. Don't do that. Um, input language is more complex than deterministic context-free. Um, this is one that I, I often like to explain by saying your input protocol should look no more complex and intimidating than JSON and shouldn't look across to other JSON documents to figure out whether the current one is valid. Um, this is a good way of explaining it, but it leaves out one of the most important things, which I was talking about in previous slides, which is that Although you might well be able to enumerate all of your inputs and thereby make it less complex than deterministic context-free, um, you shouldn't because um, that model is not amenable to figuring out whether the bugs are there. You can't meaningfully reason about it. And the reason that the input language shouldn't be more complex than deterministic context-free is because you've exposed, if it is more complex, too much functionality, potentially a complete Turing machine, um, to your attacker. And so if you, instead of exposing uh, something that's high on the Chomsky hierarchy to your attacker, you just expose a lot of very low-level complexity, um, we found that these things are exactly equivalent. And we found that in, in our experience designing this component, even with a truth table that was only a few columns wide, um, we still had immense trouble checking that our constant implementation actually matched the thing that we were intending to do. And actually, a program, even though Turing complete, may well have been much easier to check. Um, Non-minimalistic input handling is another one that I haven't really gone over here, but this is effectively the same thing as shotgun parsing in many respects. It's your input handling should have as few features as possible. This is the turn off XML entity expansion in SACS. Simple enough. Um, if you, the, the science here is don't expose complexity to your attacker that doesn't need to exist. And so um, if your input handling does anything other than just check the input, put it into deserialized types, and verify whether or not it's valid, um, then that's additional power given to the attacker that didn't necessarily need to be there. Um, parser differentials is another one. Um, this one simply explained is I have a line and both ends of that line disagree about its meaning. This is when I cross-connected uh, one of the lines that detects whether a path is occupied um, to whether or not um, there's an incoming call on a line. Um, if both ends don't agree about what exactly the protocol means um, within very well enumerated bounds, for example, if you have an x.509 parser and it doesn't understand what a critical section is and so ignores it, um, your violation of the specification is likely to be material. Um, and so avoiding parser differentials is something that is best done by making sure that your specification is not incomplete and that people, when implementing it, actually implement the full specification. Uh, an incomplete specification is more or less inviting parser differentials because it leads people to guess um, what the meaning of particular special cases in the protocol are. And that NTP bug that I mentioned earlier where a null key would allow you to just assert authentication and update the time on fairly high stratum clocks, low stratum clocks, um, the problem there was that the specification didn't really say, and in fact the reference code for NTP implementations didn't show that this particular flow should not be allowed, and so it was allowed. Oops. Um, overloaded fields is another one that's really evil, and we try to overload fields as little as possible. Um, when designing the circuits, one might find that fields often get overloaded um, because you have a pin, and like, depending on the context, that pin might be an input or an output. Um, you have to be very careful with this. That's kind of playing with fire, because if the circuit isn't in the state that you think that it is, the pin doesn't have the signal on it that you think that it has. And so thinking back to my, my circuit diagram from before, um, we thought that the pins 1D through 3D on that latch would have the correct signal on them for which line you should be on when the latch flipped over. It turned out that that was not actually the case. Um, 
and that's why it was possible to accidentally be put onto paths that you shouldn't have been put on, um, effectively because that field was uh, was a little bit overloaded and we didn't have, like the, the pin could have been either find the next available path or find the path that has an incoming call on it for me that's next. But um, we didn't well enough define by not putting the correct timing capacitors in when it was one state or when it was the other. And so effectively that field had two meanings at once. And that is a thing that you cannot have. Uh, go on. Ah, ha, ha. So this isn't the inbound signaling part of the phone switch. Um, no, it does sound a little bit like inbound signaling, doesn't it? Because the phone network is one, if you wanted to model it that way, one gargantuan circuit. Um, so no, um, it's, it's almost inbound signaling, though. This is all behind a logic boundary. Um, the only input in it that depends on the line electrically is whether or not the line is picked up. But if you allow these signals to ingress, for example, their AC, or we're allowing people to charge the capacitor, we can have emergent inbound signaling. And that is effectively what the bug is. Um, permissive processing and invalid input, I think I went through uh, more than enough. You have to know that your inputs are what they say they are. And uh, if you intentionally be liberal in what you accept without knowing what it is that you're accepting, um, you also have a proclivity to get bugs. In this case, maybe I should have used an inductor to filter out all of the AC because I really didn't want that. It causes glitches. And so uh, with that, I believe I am out of time. Um, so please. Um, if you have any other questions for me, I'll be at the Shady Tell camp, but um, that's me on Twitter, or I'm also available by email eventually. Thank you very much. <laughs> and apparently I do have time for questions, so if anyone has any, please fire away until I get kicked off here. Hey. Where would one get started how to do LangSec? Where would one get started how to do LangSec? Um, so, yes, the seven turrets of Babel paper is specifically designed to be accessible to software engineers with no, um, no background in the ways that academics prove whether or not something falls within the complexity classes that we wanted. Um, and so I would actually start there. Yeah, the seven turrets of Babel or langsec.org uh, has a lot of material. Um, some of the material is less accessible and more academic, but uh, some of it is um, articles and things. Um, Really, unfortunately, because, um, yeah, um, still the best source of, of knowledge is there, um, and the majority of the rest of it, because it remains very much an academic field of study, um, if you happen to have access to academic papers, um, Langsec is a good keyword to search. And uh, every year there's a workshop um, attached to the Oakland conference. Um, it was just a few months ago. Uh, IEEE Security and Privacy Workshops has a Langsec workshop that we present all of the new and latest developments in defining the terms in our field in. <laughs> Anyone else? Go ahead. One, one way to look at the bug in the circuit selection circuit was the, uh, the transition from continuous time to discrete time. Mm -hmm. You're reasoning about it in discrete time, but of course it's really a continuous time circuit, just mm -hmm. like you reason about it, it's digital, but it's really all sorts of random. Um, and like one of the normal ways to deal with that would be to use a synchronizer in front and mm -hmm. block the circuit, yeah. but then you have a much more complex circuit. But, Possibly more in your state. Um, is, like, is, is that a trade off that you, that you make consciously? Try to do the continuous time circuits? Like, if you have these kinds of time hazards and that's really. Okay, I'll try and repeat that as much as I can. Um, so the question was basically, um, first pointing out, um, the bug, the timing attack that we have in here seems to derive from the difference between the fact that we're reasoning about the circuit in discrete time, and yet it's really a constant time circuit. Um, and the answer is, uh, yes, absolutely, that's where the bug comes from. Um, the additional was um, this could be potentially solved by a clock, although having the clock in the additional state adds additional complexity, which would also then have to be reasoned about. Um, this is also very valid, and so the question was, um, is there a conscious trade-off that we made between those two things? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we found that for a circuit of that class, the complexity that would have been introduced by a clock um, would have been 
close enough to the complexity that would have been introduced by a microcontroller, we would have had to make sure that the states had settled before the clock ticked over anyway. Um, we, we chose to make it discrete by adding delay capacitors so that the latch would have time to settle and we would be operating within the data sheet. And um, we did that wrong, so we should have been reasoning about it in continuous time, but we weren't. And that is how the bug happened. Um, and yes, this does totally play into the things that I was just talking about. If you're reasoning about the wrong level of your computation model, then you won't find bugs that are there. We found all of the bugs that were in the discrete computation model, but we didn't reason about it in continuous time, and so we didn't find any of the bugs in the continuous time model. And that's really also the same thing as the A2 malicious, hard, analog malicious hardware Trojans. Um, they reasoned about the x86 processor at the VHDL level, but they didn't really reason about it at the compiled VHDL level because you can't, and that's really why that paper is, is so wonderful. Um, yes, the answer is absolutely that's a consideration. the number of things that you have to reason about. The, uh, the question was, is the thesis the idea that you should uh, use a parser combinator to generate your descriptions, thereby going forward and up the abstraction model? Um, yes, because you get to take advantage of the fact that all of the things that are underneath it at the other computational levels are also verified. Does My question, um, is that something that is like, already like, well-established 